And now, uh, if we are ready, we would like to welcome our keynote speaker. And that is Abdekader Benali, calling all the way from Amsterdam. Hello, Abdekader, how are you? Hi, Kai Sing. Yeah, I'm okay. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thanks welcome. for having me. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you for being here. So Abdekader is quite a um, uh, celebrity. Um, he is um, he is one of Holland's leading writers, as The Guardian calls him. He's born in Morocco and he's won many, many awards, including the equivalent of the Booker Prize. So um, he's lived in Netherlands since he was four years old and he studied history and he's written many, many books, including two non-fiction books, I think, on running explicitly, of course, running is also weaving throughout his other works in um, in other ways. So welcome up the cutter. Is that is, is that um, is that is that right? You've written two nonfiction books on running. Uh, well, to uh, it's more it's I, I fictionalized my running experience. So the, the first book was about a young man running a marathon and uh, and I use my uh, marathon experience to turn it into an, an, a novel and uh, the second book was also about uh, my experience as a long distance runner taking time to become uh, a better runner by going to Morocco and being around uh, world elite runners for a month and I turned it also in a book but I used I used fiction uh, to to bridge the gap, the gap between the running experience and the reader, because most of my readers don't, don't run. And we all know that most of literary readers hate any form of physical exercise. They just, and they hate running the most. So, so it, it was a, a, a challenge to uh, engage the, the non-runner, sometimes even anti-running reader into believing that, that there was something of beauty and uh, truth in, in running. And, uh, and uh, well, the, the most interesting reactions came from my friends who knew me as a runner, but hated me for that. But then read, but then, and then read the book about running and they said, well, it's quite a good book because you can run the marathon without moving, you know, without getting out of your chair. You know, so so I, I was happy for those comments, uh, apart from, of course, that the running community eagerly embraces books like these, because uh, we all need references, we all need mirrors, we all need, we need art to run better. And so, so I know from personal experience that before a marathon, in the last week before the marathon, you know, you don't need to run that much anymore. You can go into this Dolce Farniente feeling, and then you can go from body to mind, you know, and you need that, you know, you need to bridge the, the week to the, to the, to the, to, to the, to the marathon. So what, what we, do, what we then do, what runners do is that they find the time to read a little bit more. And, uh, and, and then they use my book as a way of uh, mental doping, you know, kind of mental doping, you know, to start, you know, focus on, on those uh, gruesome 42 kilometers. That sounds like a way to sell your book. I hope your agent hears that. Mental doping for people preparing to run. I mean, that that's a very good sales pitch. Yeah, but yeah. you've just you've just opened the session beautifully and powerfully. You've gone in hard. Brilliant. Because you've talked about how readers don't like running. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's something I'll definitely like to get into. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fiction as a bridge. I mean, yeah, I mean. We first met 10 years ago and you were telling me how you started running since you were a child. Um, and so how, how did that come about? I mean, um, and well, how have you kept running? Are you yeah. still running today during the pandemic? I, 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 well, I, 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 I ran yesterday uh, uh, 9K, I ran 20K last Sunday. I ran during the pandemic. It was great. It was great. And it was also nice to see that uh, because of the pandemic and all the restrictions on, uh, you know, uh, fit, fitnessing indoors, people would go out running. So what we have seen, we have seen a run uh, on uh, shoes. We have seen a run on, on running clothing because 
because of Corona, we had to keep distance from people. And in a way, running is, you know, learning how to keep distance, you know, so, so that's what happened. And I saw this and it made me even, it made me understand what running is all about. It, 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 I came closer to, to, you know, finding the, the, the solution to the riddle why running is always, is eternal. You know, there is never uh, a definite definition of running. It's it, 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 the moment you think you have it, you know, in a phrase or, or, or you have concluded something, you know, about this running experience and you have, you thought you, then suddenly you go out for a run or you see someone running and you come up with new ideas. So, so, and, and Corona has brought a lot of new ideas to, uh, to running. But let me tell something about my own running experience as a child. I became a runner because I saw people running. This is the thing, the thing with running. You see people running and it gets to you. It, it becomes uh, like a virus. You know, you, you want to be, you want to feel the fever because you're feeling the fever of the other. And uh, so I saw this uh, African runner at that time in 87, uh, breaking the world record on the marathon in, uh, in, uh, in Rotterdam, um, uh, where I come from, where I was brought up. And I saw Densimo, uh, breaking the world record and it was there was there was something quite crazy because i did not associate rotterdam at that time as a running city and then i suddenly i saw this ethiopian uh, runner elite runner densimo breaking the world record and in a way elevating my city to a hero hero heroic place a place where uh limits were overcome a place where there were world records to be broken you know Suddenly those streets and roads, Rotterdam, where I as a kid would walk or bicycle, they became the terroir of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of heroes. And then, and then I saw, of course, uh, run, uh, the Moroccan runner Said Awita, you know, in 87, become world champion in, uh, in Rome in the five kilometer uh, track and field race. And it made such an impression on me also, you know, this, this skinny guy from Casablanca, you know, just outrunning everyone, and and uh, I mean, I mean, I, mean, I can. Uh, Saida Wida is, is quite a symbol because he was uh, he was not only an elite, elite runner, but in his uh, in his running was extraordinarily gifted. So these, uh, let, let's say, uh, stories of others uh, became kind of mirrors, and and at the time I had some. Let's say I was a chubby child. I wasn't, you know, I came from a migrant household. Uh, in my family, no one did sport. You know, my father would never run. You know, he would never do sport. He didn't like sports. He didn't watch football or soccer or whatever. You know, we had a very, in, in a way, we were st st static. And um, for me, running was also uh, freedom. You know, it was, a, it was a way to go uh, in a legal way outside you know to become become part of the world and 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 broaden my horizon you know because where my breath brought me was my freedom so to become to 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 get more freedom i had to have a deeper breath you know i have to run harder uh, i had to go faster because you had to be back home for dinner of course and you know i could not go out uh, eternally because I had to become uh, get home before the dark. So becoming a faster runner was associated for me as a child with, with freedom, you know, and feeling the breath, you know, feeling this breath and this rhythm of the breath and the fact that there was a kind of limit to the breath that you could overcome by becoming that 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 that, that had a kind of magic that that has not left me since uh, since then. Um, can, yeah, what you've just said just made me think, why aren't you translated in English, for goodness sake, or yeah, you, are, yeah. you should, we, we need think, to get more of your writing in the English yeah, one, or it, a lot it, of what you've said are just so, yeah, uh, it so will, it, potent. Yeah, it will, it, it will, it, uh, hopefully it will happen when I'm dead. So uh, then, then the book will come out, you know, we like to discover, right, we, we like to discover, right. And then we but, will sell. We we'll tell people then, about this recording then, that we made. Exactly, exactly. But but the, the thing is also, uh, I think a, a, a publishing uh, uh, worldwide uh, is maybe. I mean, we in Holland, we we had this uh, 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 a, a pub uh, 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 like twenty years ago. You could not write about soccer in a literary fashion. 
you know, soccer was working class people, was uh, physicality, was rough, you know, there was hooliganism involved, you know, literature had to stay away from the body. You know, there is a very, very strict uh, Descartian um, antipathy in the literary world towards the phenomenon of the body, you know, while the philosophy has embraced it, you know, you know, we have the phenomenology and with Bergson and then your body is, but in literature, the thing is, everything concerning the body is, is filled, you know, sexuality, sweat, you know, it's all associated with the lower, you know, and then, and then suddenly, uh, like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there was this group of Dutch writers who started writing in a literary fashion about football and soccer. And in a way, they broke, they broke the taboo. They, they brought in working class exercise, you know, sport into literature and, may, and emancipated, in a way, sports into literature. And I started writing about running because I was inspired by those people, you know, this, this, uh, this wild pack, but also by a writer like Tim Crabbe, who wrote a book about bicycling, you know, the, the, it's called the, the Runner, you know, it's, it's published by, by Bloomsbury. It's about this guy who, who, is, who, who is in a, in a, in a, in a bicycle race in, in the south of France. This book has become a classic in Dutch literature. So, and I thought, well, then me as a, at that time, you know, 10 years ago, we met, I was, I was training for the Amsterdam Marathon and I was very, very fanatic. I said to myself, I want to translate these feelings I have, this, this, this amount of ideas that, that are concerning body and mind, the horizon, you know, the, the phenomenology of, of running. I want to put it into literature. And there was something that, to my surprise, landed very well within the, within the literary world because it got good uh, reviews, etc. But there's still work to be done because we still tend to put sport books there and literature there. And we're working on, I, th I think, by doing things like this, you know, coming together, you know, talking about this, you know, creating bridges, you know, we, we I think we're in a way also emancipating uh, literary, literary uh, sensibility. No, absolutely. I mean, that was why I interviewed you. I needed someone with some weight to put in my important research paper <laughs> about <laughs> how, uh, because I was actually... So when I interviewed you, I was asking for your help to respond to, because there was so much work out there. There is the shelves, libraries of work celebrating the mind and then also celebrating walking as part of that culture, as, as, as the backbone of Western civilization. That's the words of yeah. Finkerkraut, Ellen Finkerkraut. And then, of course, there's all the other people, Zizek, Bordi, um, Baudrillard, quite a few people um, have made direct criticism about running and it's it mm. just speaks again and again to that yeah. kind of hierarchy yeah. the yeah. mind body hierarchy yeah. Yeah. and it's yeah 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 what we need so it's what, so fascinating to hear that but but i think what we need now we we need we don't i think us a lot i know zizek Baudrillard very well very good but we need practice we need practiced runners, you know, practice, you know, people who run, who articulate ideas about running. Because even though I, I like Baudrillard and Zizek, but there, there's no sweat in the game. You know, there is no sweat in those, you know, the criticism of theorizing. You know, it, it's, it does not escape, let's say, the, 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 the mind-body schism that's there. But, but, but I really, I mean, by writing my marathon, marathon book, I really try to bring the body into the language. I wanted you to feel sweat. I wanted you to feel that running is in the way hell. You know, there is no romanticism involved. Training for a marathon, it, it, dis, it, it kills everything. You know, it kills your personal life. It kills your relationship with people. It can kill your family. You know, it's, it's, it's so egoistic. It's, and, and then doing training is so boring. I mean, the most boring thing that you can do is train for a marathon, 12 weeks. It, it has nothing to do with the mind. There is no imagination involved. And talking to elite runners confirmed this. I, I asked them, you know, when I was in Ifran in Morocco, you know, I met them when I meet them here in, in Holland. How do you train? How do you run? What do you think? How do you eat? What do you dream? And it's incredible. They're so boring. They're so boring. And an African elite runner, he is, he is, if he, what I got out of it was, when you start thinking about running as a runner, you become you become a bad runner. 
thinking is the enemy of running. <laughs> the moment you start in your head, allowing some reflection on your running, you lose it. Because running is preparing the body to be without mind. You know, you come to the race and you feel totally psychotic. You know, you feel paranoia because you know, I got to do the, I, I, I cannot need my, I don't need my brain in this race. If I need, if I think in this race, I'm going to lose. You go to, you have to go numb. It's, it's almost like preparing for a war. And what I got out of these elite runners, they were like, I would tell them, what, what do you think, you know, when, when uh, what do you think about, you know, um, running in Holland? You know, and they would say, oh yeah, that is, that's good. Running in Holland is good. And I asked them why? And then they said, because it's easy. Why? Because, you know, they said, because, because everything, it's such a flat country. And then they said something, but the best thing is after we have run the 10K or the, or the half marathon, we get a certificate that we run the 10K. And, with, and because you in Holland, you measure everything so exactly, this certificate is like a passport to other races in the rest of the world, because it shows we really were like, you know, formally around the 10K race. And I was like, okay, okay. So this whole, so the elite runner is not, and, and then, and then of course, I, I, I know, I, I, I hang, I, 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 I discovered something which we tend to forget in when we talk about running, that is, that is that, that when do you, okay training is good exercise is good you know go but the most important element of of running of preparing for a race is not the intensity of the race because they all do this you know the elite runners you know even my, me as a fanatic you know i do everything i need to do you know to get there but it's very very difficult to relax as a runner you you if when you become you want to become an athlete you have to learn how to sleep you have to learn how not to worry you have to learn how to die and that's incredible. I mean, these elite runners, they, I mean, I hang out with them. They run, and, and I can tell you, the, the, the way they train, it's, 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 like, it's like chess grandmasters, you know, like, they, like they're on another universe concerning the way, that, the intensity. But, they, they, but the, what made most impression on me is how they sleep, because they would, they would come back from running, and, was, and, I, and I, I was sharing a room with an Algerian runner, and this, this guy, he would go into his bed, and he would sleep in 10 seconds. An African runner, when, he, when he's picked up, you know, to go to the race in Holland, the first thing he does in the, when he goes into the car, the stretch of five kilometers to the, to, the, to the start, he sleeps in the car. So this, they go in hibernation and they do this like on the spot. And for, we, for us in the West, that's very difficult because we are not used to rest. We, we, we think we go training and we train and then we go to the bar or the cafe or you know, the clubhouse and we start having a beer and we talk. And then when we, it's, you shouldn't do that. You should go home and sleep, preserve the energy and let the body become stronger. And that was something, that, that was an insight that I also took into writing actually. That was something that learned me how to live and how to write and how to think. Like put, put your effort and do the best you can you know, raise the bar. The moment you did that, that also learn how to relax, like uh, 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 the maximum you can. And relaxation is very difficult because it, but because you need to put a real effort in it. See that that sort of tension is just powerful. It is. It's and you said, you said. Um, you have to learn how to die. <laughs> and it's, it's almost like a spectrum where you're bouncing off the two ends. So you're living so much less sweat and it's dirty, which is why the intellectuals hate yeah. it, right? It's filthy, yeah. it's smelly. Yeah. And then you also have to just switch to have this ability to just switch and hibernate just yeah. like that. Um, it's, it's, it's really about how, how to deal with pain. And because, because when you go for running, you, you, you part of this, you know, the part of the deal is that you have to suffer pain. You have to learn how to suffer this, 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 this pain on your body. And you have, in a way, you even have to like it a little bit. But I can tell you something. The moment you start a 10K race, you're in the red zone immediately. Red zone, I mean, you know, your, your heartbeat is 180. You're in the red zone, you know. It's, and every step you take, between the first kilometer and the last is pain. And it's 
when you're in a red zone around six kilometer, you know, and you still have four kilometers to go, you do, you cannot think, what am I doing? Because it will it will kill you on the spot. You know, you have to then just stop. So what you do in training, you learn how to condition yourself to not not to like pain, not to think pain, but to not to suffer pain, but just to live with it, to live with the pain. And that's something I can understand why. You know, <laughs> that's confrontational because why are we doing this? It's, it, it's, it's the body was not made for that. The body was not made to run 15K an hour. You know, it was not made, you know, you know, we were, you know, it's, 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 it's absurd. But, but the, the fact that it's absurd brings me to the running. You know, I can't explain this to you. But what I can explain to you is that I really feel, uh, uh, gratification when I'm when I feel them out of breath, but then afterwards, but not never in the race itself. So and that's why running is good for writing because 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 of you you tend to distort the image of what you suffered, you know. Because when in the race, it's nothing is likable. It's not there's nothing to write about. But when the moment you finish and your body goes into recovery and you start thinking. Then you, so then you start becoming very nostalgical about your experience. You become very romantic and you suddenly see all these uh, possibilities that running offers. So this nostalgia is quite an immediate nostalgia of an experience that you might have just experienced if you just come back from a run. So are you saying, let me get this right, <laughs> you were talking about hibernation, death, and then you were saying that's quite close to writing. So writing is death and hibernation oh no I, I shouldn't take on such a topic with a writer no but but no but i think i think i think i mean writing is also alone it's, it's also a lonely affair you know you have to be alone for a long time and and 80 of the writing is just it's just killing it's just it's just it's boredom and killing i mean but you have to you have to be disciplined and to keep to it and to and to expect and allow and even applaud the, the suffering that comes with it because and i don't even mean suffering in the in the christian you know uh, western but more of that you just you feel numb and you feel boredom and you feel a loser you know you feel you're not uh adding anything to the prop break uh per capita income of the of, of your community you know but then you make you have to learn to make a very big uh bow and at the end of it, you will get something out of it. And that makes writing and running a very nostalgic uh, 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 operation. Mm, fascinating. And, uh, yeah, mm. but, 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 but running is easier than writing in the end because running is very, it's not like football where sometimes a lucky one wins. Running is, is, is honesty. Running is you trained, did you train enough? Yes, then you will get this, you will have this time you know, you will succeed. So it's so honest, it's so open, it's so crystal clear, while, while writing is not that crystal clear. I, mean, I do not know how I get to my stories. Um, yeah, and or if you did know, you're not going to share that because that's your trade secret. Um, I have so many things to ask you, but I really want to pick up on something that maybe speaks universally to the migrant experience. Uh, you, you mentioned food, and I know you also work with your partner on a food program. Um, you were talking about how you were a chubby child. Um, today is the last day of Chinese New Year. That's why I'm wearing a fancy dress. Okay. And um, Tay, um, Yohei, uh, one of our artists were presenting earlier. She was also talking about missing home so there is something about the migrant experience and the body recovery and food um do you want to talk to that a little bit and then i want to really get you get your views on the current and running artfully but i really want to in, i want you to indulge yeah. us a little bit about yeah food well, and well, the migrant well, experience if that's okay yeah uh, i mean that's <laughs> But food, food for me was, you know, for me, running and training was also an excuse to eat a lot of food because, you know, there's this famous phrase by uh, Parker Jr., this, uh, this uh, 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 track and field runner who, who said, when you train hard, that you're burning, you're burning at such a high speed that whatever you throw in your body, it, it will burn. You know, your body becomes an oven. 
And I like this metaphor, you know, that when you train that hard and you live for your sport, your body becomes an oven and it can just burn everything. So, you know, uh, immediately, uh, immediately after a race, you can just eat every, you know, you can eat all the junk food in the world and it, burn, and it goes like, the, you know, it's like, you know, it, it liquefies immediately, which I did. Uh, and also, I mean, I mean, I mean, for me, food is important, as you say, because of, of, of course, uh, food is living memory that reminds me of my, my, my roots, you know, it reminds me of Morocco and I, I was brought in a, in a migrant uh, family in Rotterdam, I was brought up with, with the food of Morocco. So there was a very much strong identity involved uh, to it and still it still has. I mean, I, I wrote a cookbook about Moroccan food. I, 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 I did some research on Moroccan food, etc. Globalization, Moroccan food, etc. Uh, but when it comes to running a food, it's, it's very strange because it's also not nothing, it's not romantic, but when you run a train for a marathon, then at a certain moment, food becomes information. It does, it, it loses, you know, you just eat, you just start eating and it doesn't matter what you eat because it's not that important anymore. You know, you just only concern about calories and sugars and carbs and low carbs and, and, and you know, and, and, then, and then what comes into play is this whole total obsession with uh, technology food. You know uh, all those uh, liquids and protein shakes. You know, <laughs> so you have two kinds. You you start becoming. You know, you have the, the, the even if you're a connoisseur. I mean, I love my food, but it doesn't really matter. It's, I'm looking at my food. I'm just looking and thinking, how many carbs is this? How many calories? And how how much can I run with this? You know, what what do I, what do I need to do to survive as a runner? So it becomes information. And then, and then afterwards, of course, when 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 the run has been done, you know, I mean, I start eating paella and couscous, and and, and you just become very gluttonous. And uh, uh, but I also saw that when I was with these elite runners, that food was totally not important. You know, they did they did just didn't care for their food. They just ate what was there. They ate everything. You know, fat chicken in, in boiling oil or potato fries. They just ate it and. They didn't really care. But though in the West, we have a total obsession with food. You know, we're just talking all the time about how many... So when I'm with the Dutch runners, you know, here in Holland, you know, during the running, we talk about food. And I never understood this. You know, we would go for a training and then we would talk with, what did you eat yesterday? How many carbs? The total obsession. Well, I would think, you know, be a bit more esoteric, you know, just eat what you like, you know, eat what makes you happy. Eat some vegetables, you know. Uh, eat some uh, good carbs, uh, and run, you know. But but we really the thing is interesting that that I come from a culture where food is associated with uh, homeopathic qualities and alchemy, you know. Chinese culture, you know, it comes from there, you know. So so the whole idea that eating certain types of food, you know, uh, is good for this temper, that temper, you know. I mean I mean my my mother would say. You want to run faster, eat this, you know, you want to sleep better, eat that, you know. But the thing is that the Dutch have a very uh, rational uh, approach of food, you know, it's nice, you eat it, you have a glass of wine, you know, it's, but when it comes to running, it's very strange. Runners become like shamans. They become like, like, you know, like magicians. You know, they start talking about, about a certain type of carb or a certain kind of food or a certain kind of liquid or shake that will, that will in a way, and we all know this is nonsense. It just make believe, you know. But but these people who are you know highly educated, they go to length, you know, it, with this obsession with a new kind of uh, 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 shake that has come into the market. It's come, and most of it comes from Scandinavia, you know. It comes from Sweden, you know, and it's like very. You, know, it's come, you have to order it, you know, by. Uh, and then of course you also have of course everything that that's on the edge of doping you know you know but that's all different uh, that's that's another theme i could talk about but uh, but the food is yeah and we we do have uh we do have a scandinavian here uh matty and maybe he will be preparing his question for you we also have talked about um food earlier on and recovery so that those will be questions that are coming up i think but um from 
So, and, and I'm really glad you've given us the permission to just go crazy on chocolates, jelly babies, um, whatever it is that is your poison. Yeah. That's, that's, the thing, the thing, that's great. The thing, the, what, well, the thing is, the thing is that, that, that it's very important. I always tell it to people who start running. Mm. The, I never ask them when they start running, how did you run or, or, or how far did you? I always ask them, did you eat well after the, the running? Because yeah. you eat, you have to eat well. It's very yeah. strange. It's, it's it's almost anti and uh, anti, anti intuitive. You know, we, we we most of the people start running to lose weight. You know, I think ninety percent come to running because of weight issues. Mm -hmm. What people think is, I do is I'm becoming more sport, sportive. I'm becoming mm -hmm. more uh, healthy, so I yeah. also eat less. Yeah. But I can tell you something: when the body goes to its optimum, it starts eat. It stops eating. When you when you become fitter and fitter and fitter, there's a certain point where the body says, "I don't I don't want that. I have enough I have enough food in my in my system." You know, we all know this. You know that that suddenly you have, you have trained so you have trained for a marathon, and then suddenly you come home and you eat a little bit, and you're not that super hungry anymore. Which mm -hmm. means that the body has become so fit that it doesn't need that amount of energy to to perform its uh, its mm -hmm. task. Mm -hmm. So, I, but but when you start running. And when you eat, you have to eat well, you know, you have not, don't go against, you know, with this, this food craze of no eat and eat till you feel and because the body will need the energy because you need energy to run and you need energy to recover. Absolutely. Absolutely. We should now also buy your cookbook. Um, I want to open this up to the audience soon, but I just want to end on a big one, uh, which is to invite you because you were, we, we were just talking about being migrants and of, obviously you have been very vocal from beginning of time about Europe's anti-migrant sentiment. And um, you've been very vocal about um, political issues. Um, I was reading up and doing Google Translate on what you have been saying. And obviously um, we are in a moment of multiple crisis. And I'm just wondering what your interpretation of um, a, an entanglement of art and running could do for this moment. And it's so interesting that you were talking about running as being like a virus. Again, this is this very powerful kind of juxtaposition of something that's supposed to be health giving with something that is um, like poison in a way. But also, I really like how you were saying it was during the pandemic that it that yeah, the pandemic yeah, confirmed yeah, everything about yeah, running yeah, that you knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, what I see in Holland in the, ur in the urban zones, you know, uh, we talk about Amsterdam, Rotterdam, I think it's the same in London, Manchester, Birmingham, you know, uh, is, is that, that our public space has become a, 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 a common space, it has become the, the space of the people. You know, our parks, our woods, our, our, our streets, our rivers. And this, this has to do with, with a lot of uh, global issues, like the warming of the earth, you know, the, 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 earth, the, the world is getting warmer, you know. So what, what do you do when it gets warmer? You're outside. What's happening in Amsterdam is that the, the, the apartments are getting smaller and more expensive. So you want to be more outside, even if you have a very nice apartment, you know, in a very nice area, being inside is, you know, is, is, is suffocating. So people are more outside. What you also see in the urban zones is that, is that the public spaces become more safe. Our parks, our rivers, our woods are becoming more safe, are becoming more hospitable. You know, it's also to do with uh, our general economical circumstances, wealth. Then what comes into play is that democracy, uh, uh, especially liberal democracy has given us a notion that the world is mine. You know, I can claim this space. So what we do is we use the parks as our living room. Look, I'm here with my friends having a beer, my space, my space, my space, my space. So this is, has also contributed to a different evaluation of our public spaces. Um, it, it comes from necessity. It comes from all these reasons I, I know. And then you go into running. And running is for me like almost uh, it has become cool. You know, there's something happened the last 10 years. I, I, I couldn't foresee this, but that running has become something you do when you, you, you want to show you are 
a healthy citizen. There's a status, there's a new status, you know, and, 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 it, and uh, young women run. I mean, Amsterdam, there's so many young women who run, uh, but also young Muslim women run because also of Corona, you know, sitting inside, you could not go to the fitness, you know, it's all, I don't know how the UK is, but here it was all closed down. So people start discovering their public space. They discover they can go out of the public space, exercise and, and, and own it. So there's I, this obsession with owning your, your, your space. And then, and then art, and then I think our art comes into, into play. I think art is always about the, the illusion of identity. You know, you, you create an illusion of what you are, who you are, and you tell stories. And I think that doing sports, doing sports in general, but running in general has become a storytelling tool for the, for the lost individual in the big city. It's his way of saying, look, this is where I am, I'm on Strava. You know, I don't know about Strava, but there's also a big topic we can talk about. I saw some of the artists, you know, you, you know, showing their, uh, how they walk. Well, it's, it's, it's crazy. I love it because there's total obsession with your parkour, you know, the, 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 the way you walk. It has become an identity thing. It says it is very attached. Why do the people do this? They do this because they show this is who I am. I run so I am, you know, and I'm here. It's about positioning yourself in time and space. And by showing mobility, you should, I mean, that's the, I mean, our liberal system has, has pushed running to the fore, you know, meritocracy, the, if you put in a lot of amount and effort and, and you will get there, you know? So what we have here in Holland, we have this obsession with business runs, you know, you know, I don't know about UK and there's about this business run, you know, you, 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 you have these businesses, you know, uh, lawyer firms or uh, a chocolate firm, and they all have groups of runners and they start uh, uh, being part of the race as a collective. So it's collective and you do it with each other and you're sweating and afterwards you cry, and, you know, it's emotion. You know, you afterwards you finish together and we did it as a group, you know, this is this group hug and also identity. Um, a lot of things come together in, uh, in running and also it has become in a way it has become an art form because clothing and the type of shoe you have, the type of socks you have and the, and the watch you have, it has, it, it stayed this later, but it has also, it's rich with symbolism. And uh, I, when we talked 10 years ago, to tell you the truth, uh, okay, I thought that running was at its end. I thought it has, it has, it has reached its max, it has its maximum potential. You know, it cannot, it cannot, there will not be more crazy people coming in. But then we saw the diversification of running. We know you got the trail runs and long distance runs and the color runs and the diversity runs. And, 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 and then something else happened, the fetish with the marathon, you know, Marathon is 42 kilometers, but nowadays when someone run, runs 5K, we call it mini marathon. You know, and we and we start use and we stop using mini. We just say I run a marathon. What? Yes, 5K marathon runner. You know, this, this, this total um, and this comes to Badri. Uh, we go back to Badria, which is the, the age of spectacle. You know, you know, the, running is theater. It's 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 performance art. I mean, I was tell. Show me the way, show me how you run and where you run, and I tell you who you are. Yeah, that that sounds like what Baudry Baudry was doing. He was watching from the window in New York and he was looking at the New York Marathon. And he did make the link to death also, but he was mm. doing it out of um just being nasty <laughs> and being ignorant. <laughs> um that, that was fascinating. Um, um I want to um, maybe ask you about um, the future now very quickly and then open this up to, to um, colleagues because um, there are lots of questions coming up um, and I haven't had a chance to read that. But I know you now have two young daughters and um, we know that um, a lot have been said about how this is such, the past few years have been such a, such a kind of a sea change in things, the paradigm has shifted, the kind of polit and politically in terms of democracy and so on and so forth. And um, with, um, I mean, now when you are in exotic Europe, I mean, we are in the UK, we're in the island, we are Brexited, we, are, we have nothing to do with you. 
Um, <laughs> so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are with regards to the future, maybe the future of running, but also the future with regards to young people. I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this is that we wanted younger people, and I don't mean just age, but kind of new people, um, people who who are from a different background, who we don't know, to kind of step forward and to kind of um, now carry on the conversations. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, because people have said that with with Black Lives Matter, with um, say um, um, climate change, it's a lot of kind of new faces who are leading the conversation in new ways. And I'm just wondering if you have anything to say about that. And also maybe that and the, yeah, if it's not too much to ask, that and the future of running, because you said you didn't see it coming, running being so big. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think I think uh, uh, running still has to find its way, a uh, place in the emancipation of newcomers in Holland, because uh, predominantly running uh, is, a, is a white sport. It's a, it's a white sport in Holland for the amateurs. But when it comes to elite running, it's it's a black sport. It, it's dominated by, 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 by African talents for almost 90 percent uh, but when you look at uh you know uh, urban zones in, in holland 90 percent of the runners are, are, are not black but but are white it's a middle class highly educated uh female uh so so there, there is some there, there has uh there's some uh, emancipation work to be done there and that 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 that, that will work out when we understand better how to get young people into uh, to to running, but but uh, I see this already happening. Uh, but we need uh, a mentality or a, 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 that 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 newcomers uh, feel welcome in the running world. I mean, that, that's a work to be done there because it's so predominant, so dominated by one uh, ethnic group, and I can understand that as a newcomer, you do not feel welcome. I can understand it very very well. But the thing is that, that 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 these are the it's the newcomer that makes the running, you know. It's the newcomer that 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 discovers his talent in running. It's people who come in from Somalia as refugee who land here and they become elite runners and they, they carry the Dutch sport. So integration. So, so and and I say this because why do I say this? This is because I think sports are very, very important for integration and for emancipation. I mean, when you look at Black, Black Lives Matters, it was carried forward by the, the, the Afro-American uh, 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 athletes in America. You know, they were very, very, very uh, instrumental and uh, uh, outspoken in, uh, in bringing that uh, movement to the, uh, to the bigger audience and uh, reaching out to the other groups that, that were not directly involved with it and, and bringing them, you know, to sympathize with that group. So we need uh, those uh, sports symbols. And I'm, I'm an intellectual. So for me, I have this, I always think maybe, maybe, um, maybe I'm wrong that, that ideas come from the mind. You know, and that ideas start little, and they become, and they become, they go into the public sphere. And we talk now about this, and then within ten years, ten million people will talk about it. They start small. We we have this 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 talking heads, but things, but but also sports and 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 the symbolism of sports, and we have to understand this and appreciate this, can be. They can be. They can do groundwork in uh, in formula, formulating intellectual intellectual ideas about respect for the body, the female body, the disabled body, the 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 the, the body that does not feel included. They can formulate a very strong. And you know why? Because we, in a way, we live in an age of the body. That's my point. I want to make. We live in an age totally obsessed by the body. When I, when I do a reading in Holland and I say, I wrote 20 books, people are, are say, yes, we know, you know, an intellectual should write books. But when I tell them that I also ran a marathon in 242, to, uh, you know what they do? They give me a, a, a starting up, uh, ovation. They start applauding. You know why? Because the body communicates something very deep. It's, they feel their body applauding. They're like, 242, what a marathon. You know, I couldn't that even do it in five hours. You know, I tried to, I didn't, you, what, you are, you're like, like superhuman, you know, ubermensch. And the, and the body starts like applauding, you know, and, 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 and it, it, 
it's everywhere. So the body has its own truth to tell and has its own political agenda. It has a political agenda. It has a, it has, a, it has, it has, it has also has a philosophical agenda. And people feel this. And the moment you, they feel it, you can explain to them why. And that's what people find fascinating, that they understand what their body is saying through your words, through your uh, intellectualism, to your uh, performance. It's that understanding about their mystery that, that is called body. So uh, Black Lives Matters is exactly what we talk about when we talk about the interconnection between the mind, politics, society, and sports also. Black Lives Matter, the, 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 the Black Lives, they are bodies, and they can be offended, but they can also be uh, 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 a mirror where we can see uh, uh, where we can see what is good in us, and but we can also uh, engage with each other. People feel this, you know, and and I. It's very strange that I have this with running because I when I run in in a marathon or ten k, I'm alone. I'm alone because you do it alone. But I feel an immense solidarity with all the other runners around me. We become a kind of body, a body of movement. You know, you're running for your own, but you're running with each, with within a group, and you start behaving like an organism. It's very powerful and sweet at the same time. Absolutely, that that's a that's the body has its own <coughs> power and political agenda. Absolutely, um, we have many comments and questions. I'll just pick one that I could see. Um, Bebek, is that how I pronounce your name? Do you want to um, speak up? Yeah, thanks for um, allowing me to ask a question. Hi. And, hi. and thanks a lot, Abdelkader, for a wonderful talk. Uh, um, I'm um, like you, I moved to the Netherlands when I was four, but from Iran, and I grew up under the smoke of Rotterdam. So <laughs> there's a personal hey. connection there. Although, I'm now based in Brazil, so I'm a little bit uh, further away from uh, the UK than even all of this. Um, I'm also uh, one of the founders of the Walk, Listen, Create, which is um, the home of walking artists online um, and artist walkers. But my question uh, to you is this. Um, it's very clear that your running practice influences your artistic expression. Huh? You write about running. I mean, uh, you have a wonderful talk about how running influences uh, um, uh, how you write and what you write and how you look at um, um, your writing. But how does your artistic practice influence your running? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Babak. Yeah, that's a very good question, and I, I tend, I give you, uh, um, it's, these are this is a very nice question. Um, we can talk for hours on this, uh, but I, I tend to. Part of my preparation for running is, is using storytelling devices to manage the race. So what I do before a marathon, I, I run the marathon in my head. So I may, I, before I run the marathon, I, what I do is I, I, I study the map of the, of the, of the parkour, of the, of the 42 kilometers, and I'm studying totally like, 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 a, like a spy, you know, totally obsessed. And what I do, I look on Google Maps, you know, where the route is going. If it's in Amsterdam, I already know where because I live here. But when I'm in bed or I'm just, you know, on the sofa or whatever, I'm just, I'm going into my head and I do the run. I start running it. I start visualizing it. And, and storytelling helps me because storytelling is about creating suspension, creating an imaginary horizon, creating circumstances, creating difficulties, uh, creating tension. And I feel the same in my body while I'm on the couch in my bed. And I go, and then what happens is I call this a mental preparation. I think it's I think, I think the difference, I think, and I, I think this also applies to elite runners, is that uh, being able to do this makes you a better runner. Because you're in a way you're you're preparing yourself for the unexpected. By doing this, you can never, of course, uh, catch the unexpected but you're so well prepared that you can deal with it when it happens, you know, all the scenarios. And I like to do this. I like to turn, I do the marathon or two or three times in my head, like, oh, that corner, it goes almost to the, to the meter, you know, where I'm, where am I? I'm there. And then, and then I'm at 18th kilometer and then at 21 and then this will happen. And I'm halfway. What, what will my time be? I'm just calculating. I'm, I, so 
So this is where my 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 training as a writer, my training as a as, as a thinker hel helps me uh, uh, control the, the the fear of pain and the anxiety I have with the running itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. Though I think that's also very similar to how many, for example, um, cyclists who uh, do like the Tour de France, like elite cyclists, also prepare for a race. Uh, often. Uh, they uh, they visit the route first just yeah. to be able yeah. to internalize um, all the twists exactly. and turns of the route. Um, but they're not writers. So would you say that uh, your uh, narrative in relation yeah. to your run is different? Yeah, I I think yeah because because elite runners elite they are they are not telling they're not telling stories. It's just uh -huh. about. Uh, the percentage, you know, they, their body is already so well prepared that they just, they, it's, a, it's like a check. It's like a check. Okay, yeah. uh, I have this, uh, this height, my body is responding to it. And they, but, but what I do is a kind of, it's more of a luxury thing. It's a, really an intellectual uh, uh, impromptu I, I'm, I'm having in my head, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm which I use. But 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 of course there are of course uh, 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 also I think a lot of elite runners who who also who also use these storytelling devices to prepare for the race. There yeah, for sure they are yes yes. But uh, but I know a lot of a lot of runners who do not do this. Who do not the, visualize the narrative? You mean? Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. They, they don't visualize and 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 I tell this to them. Uh, part of the preparation is a mental preparation. Put the race in your head. Imagine. Imagine the kilometers. Try to imagine the pain. Try to imagine what you were thinking. Try to imagine where you are. It's, it, it helps you uh, cope with, with, uh, with the emptiness of the race. Okay. So then also what I hear from what you're saying is that uh, your writing makes you a better runner. Does your running also make you a better writer? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it it it's it's. I mean, writing is sometimes it's sometimes so boring. I mean, I mean, you have to write so you have to sit for <laughs> long hours on a, on a day. It's really, and we, and I'm 45 now. 45. Been doing this for 25 years. So I need some escape routes. I need some escape from the writing and. Uh, and running gives me that escape room. It's easy, it's cheap. You can do it everywhere, anytime you want, which is different from bicycling or, um, so it gives me this, this is, and, then I, and then when I get back home, I can, for me as a writer, it's very important to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to not to take my writing too serious, you know, to become light again. And, and writing, uh, running helps me. I like Thanks. that, to become light again. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, do we have any other? I know there's been a lot of comments, um, but maybe someone who has written something um, feels like if, if you feel like speaking it, please do so. Maybe that's going to be easier. Anyone? Because there's been a lot um, of reactions. Anyone? Just just unmute yourself, and you can speak. Anybody? Is everyone too polite? So I, I found this. Uh, I did, someone is uh, asking, saying something. Matt, that I knew about only way to remember your ideas emerge during a run is to record them with a phone, and they still seem meaningless afterwards. It's hard to reach a state. Though. That's so. Yeah, this is true. This is so true for me. I, I have. When I'm running, I have the best ideas in the world. I, I understand the universe. You know, when I'm running, it's, it's, <laughs> everything has makes sense, <laughs> except the running. The moment you stop running, it's it's you become human being again. You know, you 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 know, it's 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 like the, the, your wings are clipped and you become human again, which also means that you have to deal with the mess in your head. Yeah, you use a beautiful phrase when I interview you. You said when you're running, you have a gorilla of ideas, and I thought, yeah, wow, that yeah, just yeah, that, that's a great yeah, and and, and 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 all the ideas are strong and good, and also in the vulnerability, promising. And uh, I think it's also a sign of health that you can feel this. 
but it's but I, I I took me some time to learn not to use these ideas. You know, it took me some time to understand that running was not made for writers. <laughs> to become better writers. Mm. You know, interesting. Yeah. It's it's actually running is more about leaving something behind. You know, it's like more about emptying the bowl. Mm. And uh, and I also like, you know, uh, what James Stevenson tells about Marina Abramovic, if I can do it with my body, you can do it well. This is like the mem mimetic power of the body, you know, the fact that we are bodily uh, uh, spheres that that mimic each other. You know, it's very mm. powerful. It's something, it, of course, it, it, it plays on a very psychological, but also symbolic level that, that the mm. body is the mirror. You know, theater is exactly that. You know, you, I, I did a theater uh, tour on running. I, I would talk, uh, I would tell my running stories. And it's one, it's, 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 it's crazy to run on stage. It's really interesting to perform the act of running on stage. Because then you become aware of how theatrical running is. And people feel this, you know, they start running with you in their mind. So you start running together as a group in the in the in the, in the you know in the in the in the, in the theater. No, and, and you did mention how you picked up running was when you saw other people running. So there is yeah, already yeah. that kind of mirroring yeah. immediately happening. Yeah. 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 And also, I mean, I mean, there's there's a lot of, I mean, running is have always been associated with 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 progress, you know. It has always been associated with bringing, uh, you know, uh, uh, messages, with bringing information, you know, underworld, upper world, uh, the god Hermes, uh, you know. It has always been associated with. Uh, you know, uh, also with bringing truth, you know, I mean, in the old times before a horse and carriage, the runners brought the messages, you know, so there is something is a uh, people on a, on a, let's say, almost evolutionary symbolic level, when they see someone finishing, they feel that he has brought truth home. When they see him coming over the finish, he has finished, they, they feel that it has been fulfilled. You know, the angel has come back with something good. Like Philippides, but he did die. Uh, oh, poor, yeah. poor guy. Yeah, poor, <laughs> poor guy. Yeah. But in a way, also, well. <laughs> but, in a, but in a way, also, then death is welcoming because it brings heroism. It brings an example for the community. It brings something mm. to strive for. You know, it brings something mm. to be good at. You know, so, so we always love a good race, you know, and we always love the, the one who finished second who loses. There is drama, there is humanity, there is uh, pity, there's a lot of emotions there. Yeah, I can I can feel you crafting your book now. Um, <laughs> shall, shall we take one last question um, from anybody? Does anyone want to vocalize something? Uh, I could vocalize something else, if that's okay. Uh, maybe not you, you've spoken, uh, if that's okay. okay. Is there anyone? Um, but if no one else wants to speak, Babak, then I'll come back to you if that's okay. Is there anyone else who wants to have the final word, final question or comment? <laughs> Maybe people are yeah. thinking of food. It is that time, yeah. Yeah. If, if there is no one, final call. But back, did, were, were, was what you were going to say short and sweet and mind um, um, uplifting? Oof, that's quite a requirement that you put down there. Yeah, huh? because. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the beauty of Zoom is that anyone can eat uh, while they're in a Zoom call. They don't yeah, need to leave sure the Zoom call to eat, right? That. <laughs> but did well, you have a final question? Video. Um, well, it was about vocalizing something, right? I'm not sure if it's a question, but um, it's an observation. Yeah, um, uh, quick, quick so, one. 
Well, uh, yeah. So, well, what I found interesting, Abdelkader, in the things that you mentioned is uh, how running uh, serves or serves served as a kind of emancipation, because you mentioned that uh, lots of young women, but also young immigrant women, were running in um, uh, in Amsterdam. You specifically said. Um, but also, uh, you talked about how uh, running as an artistic expression is related to the clothes that people wear, right? But you also brought up society as spectacle, right? So although I would argue that running and walking are ways to puncture through, the, uh, through society as the spectacle, by making it theater, which you also mentioned, and by making it an artistic statement that involves the use of personal expression through fashion, uh, it becomes more of a spectacle. So it's both puncturing the spectacle, but also reinforcing it. As I said, it was yeah. more an observation yeah. than a question. Good. Yeah. Nice observation. Well, we, we I, I mean, uh, when it comes to like, uh, I know I live in a neighborhood with a lot of uh, immigrant communities and I saw this uh, growth of uh, uh, migrant girls, you know, uh, uh, going out in public space. And that going out in public space, using it as a venue for sport, has also become a kind of public statement. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's also theater. It's like, it's like, this is my space. I am here and I, I'm not bothered by the, by, the, by the male gaze, you know, because we also have issues here of intimidation, sexual intimidation, um, men pursuing these, these girls and women. And by putting on sports clothes and by using this, this, uh, this uh, this this aura of sports, aura of running, it protects them in a way from the male gaze. You know, it's saying it's it's putting something between the male gaze and their autonomy. And I found it. Im I mean, you just brought this up. You know, this by association. But it's something I would like to elaborate more on on, on this idea that 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 by putting on clothes, by putting on a watch, you're saying I'm a professional. You know, I'm not an amateur anymore. But I'm a so treat me as a professional. You know you know, out of my way. I think it's very, very powerful. On yeah. that note yeah. about Thanks. performativity and spectacle, let's, um, shall we give, um, shall we say thank you to Abdekada for this amazing um, hour, very nourishing. And um, thank you so much for that. Uh, we are recording this, so we'll be sharing with you, Abdekada, and everyone else, the links, and then we can really go and go back and savor all the points clearly. But please do, can you please get published in, in the English language so we can <laughs> yes. start to read you and not do a Google translation of your work. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Abdekada. That's been um, incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank um, you, so 